Good evening, everyone. Happy Thursday. It is Thursday, right? Yes. I don't believe there's any big news happening in football tonight, or is there? Please stand clear of the discussion doors. Read the signs. The next stop is Highbury Squad. Boys and girls, it's another live edition of the show. Let's roll. Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to uh, the show. And joining me once again is my podcast brother from another mother, Mr. Super Kev, Super Kevin Campbell. Boom. How are you, Soph? I'm not too bad. I'm kind of happy that there's other news that supersedes any Arsenal news tonight. Um, But of course, we're going to talk about Arsenal stuff because we have the podfather himself in the house, Mr. Andrew Mangan from Arse Blog. Welcome to the show, mister. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you again. It's always good to have you on the show, um, Andrew. Welcome back. Uh, Obviously, you know, we're going to talk a little bit of Arsenal. That's why we have you on. Uh, But it would be remiss of me to not ask you two fine fellas about the big news tonight that Mr. Messi is indeed finally leaving Barcelona. Andrew. Mm. Big news. Uh, Barcelona fans, this is the kind of news that really sends fans into a complete headspin nightmare. You know, crying, hitting the bottle, you name it. They're doing it right now. Are you surprised after the back and forth a little earlier this season and it felt like maybe he was going to be staying? We all we all know the, the financial plight of Barca right now. What's mm. your take? I think the, the I read the statement that Barcelona put out, and it seems to be that the the issue is the finances that they can't deal with his salary and all that kind of stuff because of the financial pressure that they're under. It seems to be more that than some decision to to go their separate ways. They seem to have an agreement, but it's just not going to happen. So I do wonder if you know a situation where La Liga are losing Lionel Messi won't be tolerated where some kind of solution will be found for this because La Liga without Messi you know in a season where they brought in Aguero to play with him and all of that kind of stuff uh, you know I think for the sake of the league they may have to compromise but you know it'd be a huge blow for Barcelona obviously he's the the best player in the world has been the best player in the world for a long time uh, and it'd be a massive blow given how long he's been there and and still uh, at the age he's at how how reliant they are on him to uh, to score goals and and be the force that the the fans expect them to be i mean this is really earth shattering because he's a once in a generational player kev and by the way good evening squaddies uh, i do apologize i did not salute you this evening so you find folks in chat welcome of course you are the most important part of the show um Kev, this is huge, you know, and and Andrew brings up a good point because it's not only leaving Barcelona, it's what he brings to La Liga from sponsorships to um, TV money to all sorts of different layers of income um, and revenue stream that a player like him. We we saw Real Madrid um, without Ronaldo. I mean, there is something that's diminished a little bit without their rivalry too. What's your take on Messi leaving Barca? You covered them in La Liga last season as well. Yeah, I think it was inevitable. He wanted to get out the season before, didn't he? And um, it didn't quite work out on a technicality. The, 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 it's, it comes down to a simple maths equation. Barcelona just cannot afford him, even at a discount. They cannot afford him. So... They're in you know, such financial trouble. It's really sad when you think about it. Um, you know how they've mismanaged money, and and they they've had the monopoly Real Madrid and Barca too, Kev, for so long, and they find themselves in this situation. It's it's kind of gross, to be honest with you, when you think about it. Well, it, it, is it gross, or you know, listen, it was it's it's always going to come at some stage but when you think the- about it. This is the problem with money and and is the Premier League or our Premier League teams going to end up in this situation at some point? You know, I don't know how you feel about it, Andrew, but one of the things on the show, we, we our question last night to everyone was, 
you know, there's only so long Villa can hold on to Grealish. There's only so long Tottenham can hold on to Kane. They've wasted his years completely. How long, if we don't build an Arsenal team that's competitive, do we get to hold on to a Saka before someone comes in and offers 120 million for him? He's, he's signed, by the way. Grealish is signed. Oh, they're not getting a 90 day discount back guarantee. With he's the signed. Messi. He's fully signed 100 million. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's, it's a great point. You know, we have to have a competitive team, we have to have a team where the where our best players want to stay and feel like they can achieve things. And Saka, Smith, Rowe, Tierney, players like that, Martinelli, hopefully, unless we can provide them with that environment. I mean, look, go back a few years and you can think of much better Arsenal teams, much more competitive Arsenal teams, perhaps not at the level that we were, and still our best players and some of even the other players who weren't as good as them still wanted to leave. Mm -hmm. Van Persie, uh, I'm not saying Adi Bayor is in that in that class, but you know, there's a guy who wanted to leave. You know, players want to win things and they want to achieve things in their career. So it's really, really important for Arsenal to to create an environment and a competitive side, not just for the sake of winning trophies. Of course you do that, but also, you know, if you want to hang on to your best talent, as as the market has shown this summer, it's slow everywhere except for the really good players that people are prepared to pay for. Mm -hmm. Being that, so well, let's let's shift gears a little bit. Whatever will be, will be with Messi. I'm sure I'll see him here in MLS eventually. Unfortunately, he'll probably be in Miami playing for Phil Neville if he still has a job. Worst manager <laughs> yeah. ever. Um, hopefully, he'll come to um, the uh, the uh, LA Galaxy. That would be lovely someday. But I think he's Miami bound. So. Here's the question I, I'd like to ask you and Andrew. I'll start with you and then we'll shift to, to Kev because have to get your take on the re-signing of Xhaka. I know you've probably talked about it and nauseam on your show, but mm. our listeners, when um, I asked them what they'd love your opinion on the most, this one was definitely one. Um, actually, someone in chat told me I look like Xhaka today, which, you know, that's nice. I mean, he's a good-looking guy. I'll take it. Good <laughs> um, <laughs> what, what's your take on the fact that the it didn't work out not going to Roma, but then offering him an improved deal with improved money. Did that piss you off? I, I don't know if it pissed me off, but I, I just don't, don't quite understand it. I don't know why the new contract was, well, I mean, it's not official yet, but we believe it's done, but I don't really understand the need to give him a new contract. Um, it seemed like Arsenal were prepared to go a different direction this summer. It seemed like Granit Xhaka was prepared to go a different direction this summer. And I think, you know, that probably would have been good for everyone. And it feels a little bit underwhelming now, anticlimactic, doesn't it, that he's staying? Because when a player like Granit Xhaka leaves, whatever you think of him, he's always in the team. He's always picked by Mikel Arteta. He, he sees him as an important part of his team. So you can't sell a player like Xhaka and not replace him in the transfer market. And I think part of the excitement was seeing who, who are we going to bring in? Who is the player who's going to replace Xhaka in the first team straight away? So from that perspective, it's a bit anticlimactic. The, the contract thing, I, I just don't understand it. I don't know why we've done it as quickly as we've done it. I don't know why we couldn't wait till this time next year and, and assess the situation. If he, if he wants to go with a year left on his contract, he's, he's cheaper. It's, you know, uh, we could perhaps extend at that point if he's amenable to that. The, the only thing I can think of is that Mikel Arteta has decided, I want this guy in my team for the next three years, four years, whatever it might be. And Granit Xhaka is prepared to make that commitment to, to Arsenal. You know, As much as he might have wanted to go to Rome, it seems like he's w willing and ready to commit himself to Arsenal for the next number of years. So it is a, it's a bit of a strange one. I don't really understand the message it's sending out. Um, you know, I, I think we can all see that that Arteta likes Xhaka, but in a summer when when everyone seems willing to go their separate ways, to then stay and get a contract extension, I can't remember a situation like that before at all with any player. So it's an odd one. Well, it's not odd to me. And let's think about let's think about it for a minute. What do we always say about Arsenal in the transfer market? That we get well, and re and resigning players, we we always shoot ourselves in the foot because we let players run their contracts down. That's what we always say. Why do we? Why are we there with Lacazette? He's got a year left. He ain't. If he don't offer him a new contract, he's going to leave on a free. 
We argue about it. We complain. And now the football club, fair enough, Roma were trying to take the Michael out of us. We said no. We put our foot down. So what we're doing, we're protecting the value of our player. It's that simple. The fact of the matter is, he was one of our better players last season. And we had a terrible season. But he was one of our better players. I'm not Jack as Biggie's fan. Everybody knows that. But the football club are starting to do things kind of properly where they protect the value of the player. And you know what? If he if he still ends up going next season, at least there's a little bit of value there. Because if we get to next season and he's still at Arsenal, he's not going to resign. But And he's but, not going to go nowhere because he'll only have one year left. Yeah, no, I see your point. And too many players have left for free. There's no question. But we've also had situations like uh, Mesut Ozil, um, Willian, for example, where players have got long contracts on big money into their 30s. And, and you know, those things haven't worked out for us. I, I, I'm not sure about the protecting his value thing because he, you're right. He was one of our better players last season. He had a really good European championships. He was impressive at the Euros. Mm -hmm. He's 28. He's available for anyone that's willing to pay the money for him. But nobody would pay the money for him this summer. So why would next summer be different when he's older and has more years on his contract? I see what you're saying, but uh, Andrew, I also think you can put yourself in a position where, not that you're stuck with a player, but but that, that contract you give them is their last contract and they're going to see that out. There's no... There's no transfer value in this. This is a this is a commitment on the club's uh, behalf and the players' behalf to stay for that contract. I think anyway. Uh, Andrew, listen. Mm. So if Granite Xhaka was to be sold next summer, are you mm. telling me Arsenal will get nothing for him? No, I didn't say that. But this no, summer, nobody was prepared to pay. No, we because want. because we're we're coming off pandemic. Teams haven't even got had fans in the stadium. Th this is why. The transfer market is so it, it's so insipid at the moment. Nothing's really happening. The big boys, fair enough, they could make moves. Mm -hmm. Roma couldn't even afford 17 million. That tells you the state of, of, of these football clubs. Uh, all I'm saying is Arsenal have Xhaka does have a value. And it's either you protect that value or he goes for free. Kev, last week you said that we shouldn't be a club that does business with the mindset of selling on. Right? Of course. But that, that's for bringing players in. But why offer him more money? Why give him improved terms? Because he's not going to he's not gonna sign a contract if you don't improve his terms, Sophie. Well, what's the difference then between the three million we were at loggerheads with, with Roma, versus what that costs the club long term of that contract? Sophie. Here's the difference. You sell Granite Xhaka for 17 million. Let's say you sold him for 15. How much does his replacement cost? I mean, I don't know. We don't know. I mean, we found Lacombe well, for 17, and to me, he seems yeah, but, like he's ready to play. I don't, I don't believe yeah, but in this he, garbage. He can't play but, yet. But we're talking about a player who's never played in the Premier League. That's what but, you're talking about. Right. So what I'm saying is, if you're going to replace Granit Xhaka, who is an experienced midfielder, whether you like him or you don't, he's one of our better midfielders. But the point is, is bringing someone in who's better than him so we can improve So what the would it cost? Between 25 and 35 million? It's going to cost you 30 plus. But is that worth it to move the team along and not be doing the same crap we've been doing year after year, knowing what we have in front of us? We've seen the movie, read the T-shirt, drank from the mug. Yeah, but Sophie, here's, here's the problem. It's getting, it's recruiting these guys in. That's the problem. But you, it, you, you say Arsenal still carries weight, even though we don't have any European football to offer. Sophie, the, the club Arsenal is still do, a big club. Arsenal do carry weight, but you still got to, you still got to lure the player in because so, hold on, because all of the top players are wanted by all of the big clubs. But we we're struggling with that every season. I mean, that's, so that's why they kept him. But you guys who have bitched about him, complained about him, said he should never wear the shirt for my club again. How dare he tell us all to fuck off? How dare he? How dare he? How dare he? And now everyone's like, eh, well, I get why we've kept him. No, but, Andrew, that, but that's I the mean, situation, Sophie. 
I mean, what about Sa yes, and Richard Sabitzer is available for twenty million. Of course, I mean, what I this the hypocrisy just absolutely just m boggles my mind. See, I, I think we can improve even if we keep Granit Xhaka. Like, if you keep Granit Xhaka and you find someone to uh, take Mohamed El Neni and you bring in another player, you know that improves the quality of your squad overall, right? So <clears throat> Xhaka staying isn't necessarily the problem in itself, even though I think many of us were ready for something different in, in midfield. I just, I, I, I don't really get the protecting his value argument because his value diminishes year on year. As he gets older, as he gets closer to 30, his value diminishes. And if nobody this summer is prepared to pay 15 million, 17 million, whatever it was for Granit Xhaka, even with a season with fans in the, after a season with fans in the stadium, I think the financial impact of the pandemic is, is going to rip a lot, ripple on for years. It's not going to be everything is fixed now next summer because we've had fans back in the stadium. The clubs have had to accumulate massive losses. So I just don't see him as. I don't see the contract as a, a value protection move. I see it as Arsenal saying, we want you in the team. We want you to stay. You're important. Be part of the next few years. And maybe you are a guy who, who helps us bridge um, the couple of years to where Lokonga is ready and ready to start week in, week out, all going well, where Miguel Aziz has made a mark in the, the Premier League and is starting to become a, an Arsenal player. And I said this elsewhere, um, I think the the external perception of Granit Xhaka, the one that you know fans have, whether people like him or they don't like him, you know, he's a divisive figure uh, in some ways. But I think the 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 perception that fans have or the, the understanding that fans have of Granit Xhaka is really different from the one that exists within Arsenal. Mm -hmm. In that, I think he's really highly rated by the manager and his coaching staff, by his teammates. I think he's got leadership qualities, even if that whole Crystal Palace thing didn't necessarily go down particularly well. I think he's really popular in the dressing room. So I think there are, we're looking at it going, we are desperate for change. We want something new and shiny in midfield. And I don't think that within Arsenal or certainly within the dressing room, they have that same sense. So I don't think this is as big a deal to them as it might be to us. What's your take on then a play like Joe Willock, Andrew? Uh, there's reports today about a 22 to 25 million um, evaluation from Newcastle. It's down to Joe now, I think, if he wants to join them. Um, I think we've all seen him get some chances. Not sure if, again, we've set up a play like him to succeed. Uh, at the same time, I've always felt like cash in on him while his stock is high. Don't make the same mistake we did with Maitland-Niles last season. Um, but do you think he, Jack has got more experience? You, maybe then they're, they're not the same player anyway. Um, but what's your take on on Willock? Do you take the money and run? You see, I think it's I think it's kind of unfortunate that Joe Willock. You know, when you think about the players who maybe are on the fringes or in the departure lounge, Reese Nelson. Eddie Nketiah, Ainsley Maitland-Niles. Joe Willock is the one, I think, that could genuinely make a little bit of a difference to Arsenal this season. I think it's. I don't think he can play in the 4-2-3-1, certainly not in the two. So you're looking at him maybe as being something of a, a super sub kind of player. You know, we don't have another attacking midfielder after uh, Emil Smith-Rowe until we make a signing. Um, and, and Willock gives you, could give you goals. I think that the unfortunate thing is that because he has these qualities and and um, really useful qualities, you know, for a midfielder to score goals at Arsenal is a rare thing at this moment in time. Hmm. That makes him valuable, but it also makes him valuable in the market, more valuable than Nelson. And look, if we had brought in 10 million for Nelson and 15 million for Eddie and Kedia and, you know, imagine, go crazy and imagine somebody gave us a few million for Willian and we moved him on and, you know, you were able to, to bring in 30, 40, 45 million pounds from a few sales. I don't think the pressure would be on as much to sell Joe Willock. Mm -hmm. You could maybe give it a bit of time and make a decision, but 
if the only substantial offer you have in a summer is the 22, 25 million on the table for Joe Willick and, and nobody else looks like being anywhere close to being uh, a move anywhere else or there's no bids for anyone else, then I think it forces your hand a little bit to take it, you know? So I like him. I think there's something there to him. I, I get all the arguments about how uh, we should strike while the iron is hot and we, we maybe haven't sold at the right time. But I, I'd be inclined, if I could, to hang on to him for a few months anyway, and we could do what we do what we want to do in January with a loan or maybe a sale next summer. But if the money's there and nobody else is bidding for any of our players, I think they kind of have to take it. And that's the problem, isn't it, Kev? Something we keep talking about a lot. Um, I, th I, I agree. We have to take the money because there's not a lot of uh, business out there for the players that we want to offload. You know, no, no one's offering anything for Kalasinac. No one wants Willian. Um, you know, we've re-signed a couple players, I think, that maybe we should have looked to move on, like El Nenny and, and stuff like that. But your take on Joe Willock, everyone wants the Hayland lads to succeed. There's nothing more we'd all love to have them all in the team. But maybe it's just a case as well that some aren't as talented as the others and the opportunities just aren't there for them um, in this particular Arsenal team. And it's a fit as well. I think it's the fit. I think Joe Willick has got talent. We all know he's got talent and he's, he gets in the box late, etc. And Joe Willick, I think Joe Willick's the oldest out of all of them. Him and Maitland Niles, I think, are the same. Yes. But it hasn't quite worked out for him in Arsenal's first team. Whenever he's played in the first team, he never performed like he did at Newcastle in Arsenal's first team. So I think we talk about this regime having to be ruthless. We have to be ruthless. He is not a starter in Arsenal's team. So he's got to be sold because we need to bring starters in. That's and the I, difference. Yeah, and I think the sentimentality is definitely rife when it comes to like Reese Nelson, Joe Willock, Maitland-Niles, um, and, and Ketia yeah. as well. Um, you know, but there is another plethora of youth supposedly coming through that are going to be uh, maybe even more talented. Um, and we'll get to that a little bit. But uh, I wanted to get your take, Andrew, too, on the biggest news because I have my reservations about Madison. Um, I feel like he's a hot and cold player. He can be amazing for three months, maybe get injured, come back you know, woo everybody, um, do great things, score some dazzling goals, and then he'll just go completely quiet. I I don't know if Arsenal can afford a play like that when what we're striving for to just get started and back on our feet is mm. consistency in the Premier League. What's your take on Madison? Are you in the business of Madders? I'm, I'm sort of, I'm not really finding all this particularly credible the Madison stuff. I'm not sure how much interest we really have in him. Uh, like, I don't think he improves us sufficiently and weakens Leicester sufficiently for us to give uh, them 60, 70 million pounds to spend smartly the way Leicester spend money. Because if we go well next season, Leicester are going to be one of our rivals for a top six finish. I think, you know, they were there or thereabouts in the top four all of last season and fell away as, as they did. But, you know, they're going to be a, a competitor for a European place. So I'm not sure there's sufficient improvement. I'm not saying he wouldn't be a good player for us or he's not a good player. I just not, I'm just not sure that this is really a deal that Arsenal have got their sights on as much as some of the reports might, might suggest. I really think that they want Martin Odegaard. Um, and how possible that might be with the injury to Tony Cruz uh, and everything else that's going on. But my sense is that that's where their preference is. Um, you know, Madison could come in and he could, you know, he would be uh, a decent player for us, but not at that money. I just don't know that 60, 70 million for, for James Madison is the right kind of money, particularly when there's probably more value in the market out there. I know we've got a lot of uh, our targets are, are a lot of homegrown players, a lot of English players, but I think, you know, what you could get for 60 or 70 million that you pay for James Madison, what you could get elsewhere in Europe, 
when there are a lot of clubs out there, as we've said, struggling financially, mm -hmm. you could get two, maybe three good players for that. So yeah. I, I'm not particularly on board the, the matters train. Kev, I think you're on the same train with Andrew on this one, aren't you, in terms of what they're asking for versus what we can get for that kind of money? Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. I think he's a good player. I'm not saying he's not a good player. He is a good player. But he's a complimentary piece. We, mm. we, have, we have more needs in that midfield of energy. We need somebody who's com combative. We know Granite Jack is there, but we need somebody with legs. We've always needed somebody with legs to, to partner Thomas Partey. We need a right back. We need a backup goalkeeper. You know, <laughs> Osa Mawa, let's be honest now, we were after him last year for 55 million. He's there for 25 million. You get him, you get a Basuma, and you bring in a Max Ahrens or somebody like that for around about a little bit more than... 70. 70 million, 70-ish million, you've plugged three gaps in your squad, which which I think is essential. We haven't got the deepest pockets. This is the problem. We have to use our money wisely. What do you guys think of the statement today from the club saying, judge us at the end of the window? Why did you, Andrew, why do you feel like they felt compelled to say that? I mean, of course, maybe Deep down, I know why they felt compelled to say that, but really, why, why did, why so defensive? Well, I suppose the first thing is that they're just trying to keep people calm, um, because as we get towards the start of the season, people get a bit anxious about transfers and they want things to happen. I suppose the other thing is that the market really is slow, and that maybe some of the deals that we want the club to do are not going to be able to be done until the end of the window, both incoming and outgoing. I think as you get towards the last 10 days, week of the market, things start to happen because clubs and players and agents have to start compromising. Because if you're a player at a club that's not needed and not wanted and you're not going to play – you're going to start looking around. And if you're a club that needs to buy players, you're going to start making offers. If you're a club that needs to sell players, you're going to listen to offers that maybe you wouldn't have listened to at the start of the window. So I think I understand the, the anxiousness about getting stuff done before the start of the season. But I do think that this summer more than ever, a lot is going to happen towards the end of, of this market, just market forces, market pressure, all of the various things, you know, things are beginning to, to happen now. Grealish is beginning to happen. Uh, you know, Grealish has happened. Villa have spent money on Danny Ings. Southampton will need a replacement for that. Do they need Eddie Nketiah, for example? You know, the, the, these slight dominoes will start falling. So I, I, I would like us to do more before the start of the season, but I understand why a lot of it isn't going to happen until right, right at the death, right at the death, I think. Kev, do you think this is the club trying to maybe soften the blow when things don't happen? Um, no, because... no, they can't. They can't do that. <laughs> well, they... <laughs> Kev. There's no way out for them. So there well, there won't no be way this time, will there? There won't no, be the, this time, will there? Listen, let me tell you something. The club, there is no way out for these owners now. It's either they're all in. If they don't back Arteta properly, it, 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 we're on a fool's errand. We are on a fool's errand. They come out with that because obviously they've got irons in the fire. Mm -hmm. They have to have because if we go into the season and, and the, the, the transfer window closed, tomorrow we're short we're so short very like exceptionally short mm. i think actually worse off than we were last season it's, right. and i say that because we start off the season without thomas party for mm. maybe eight weeks especially um and then when you see andrew i'm a bit jelly i'm going to say it out loud i don't care Hi, my name is Sophie, and I'm a bit jealous of Leicester City and Aston Villa's recruitment this summer. Um, are you? Does it does, um, it does it bug you when you see that and the quickness of how they're doing and have done their business and the players that they've brought in as well? It's not, yeah, I mean, it's not garbage, that's for sure. 
No, but I mean, I'm not sure I would want Arsenal to spend 30 million on a 29 year old striker with a pretty patchy injury record. That's the one you know? I, I would asterisk 100%. Danny Ings at 29 yeah. with all the injuries. I, I agree with yeah, you on that one. Yeah. Look, I mean, I think the, the Emmy Buendia thing was, I think we let that go because we want somebody else. I don't believe that in a summer when Arsenal have spent 50 million pounds on Ben White, that we couldn't compete financially with Aston Villa for Emmy Buendia if we really wanted him. Like, I just don't, I don't buy that. So I think that was a matter of choice. Um, I think we always tend to look at other clubs recruitment through rose tinted glasses because, you know, it's always nice when your club signs players and stuff like that. I, I'm sort of encouraged though, by the profile of players that we're signing, you know, young players, players who can grow and develop and, and, and have potential. We filled some of the gaps. We needed a left back. We needed a midfielder. We've got that in. Um, there's a big debate, I suppose, as to whether or not we needed a center half, but we were decisive and we've done it and we've brought that player in. We've made a, a quick decision on loaning out Saliba and we've made a pretty quick decision on bringing in Ben White. But I think there are still gaps. You know, we don't have the attacking midfielder <clears throat> and we don't have a, a backup goalkeeper. And that's a big problem, I think. Particularly if something happens to Burn Leno in the opening game of the season, I don't want to see Runison or Okonkwo in goal. I don't think either of them are. Um, Okonkwo, I don't think, is quite ready, and Runison is just not good enough. So they still have some work to do before the the, the actual season starts, mm -hmm. even if some stuff is going to happen, you know, later in the window. Um, so you bring up the goalkeeper. By the way, there's 400 of you in live chat right now. You know the rules, Kev. Tell them Minimum 50% likes, guys. We're not going to stand for it. I'll, uh, if you don't hit the... Listen, if you love Arsenal, you hit the like. If you're a spud, you, you hit the dislike. <laughs> or you don't hit it at all. Or this happens. You know, yeah, Brock the next... K, Brock the next C. <laughs> there you go. It's quite easy. I mean, if you hate Tottenham, just hit the like button. That's the rule. That's the only rule of the house. Um... So what do you guys think of this double swoop for Sander Burge and Ramsdale? Let's see, so this is the juxtaposition of the previous question in terms of the profile of plays that Andrew was talking about, the, t the type of players maybe that Villa and Leicester have gone after and already signed Kevin Andrew. And, you know, everyone was kind of up in arms about the amount of money being offered to Ramsdale. Now there's a, a, a supposed double swoop in and around that 50 million mark. I mean, oh, should we be in that business, Kev? Listen, I think Arsenal have to be in the business of bringing in players. It's not every player you sign is going to be a world-class player. But Maybe we like have a, to... a twice-relegated goalkeeper for 30 million. Hey, hey listen, wh whatever. All I'm saying is we need practical players who could do a job. Ramsdale, like I've said before, I would go and get um, Johnston from West Bromwich Albion. But whoever's on the inside of Arsenal, they make their, they live and die by their decisions. Sander Berge is a, is, a, is a decent player, is a decent midfielder. He's strong, he's big. Listen, I don't watch enough of, of Sheffield United to see enough of him to see what really type of midfield, but he's a competent player. He's a competent player. So our problem is we need to fatten this squad up. We need to strengthen the squad. We do need more quality in the first 11. But we also need bodies in. Because when there's injuries, I am terrified of Ilneni in the midfield. I could tell you that much. <laughs> terrified. He's terrified, Andrew, of Ilneni. Super Kevin Campbell's terrified of Ilneni. I love it. Uh, yeah, I mean, just going to the... The, the Ramsdale, Ramsdale, yeah, please. The Sander Burst thing, I mean... Whatever you might think of them as players, they fit the profile of what we've done this summer. Like Tavares is 21, Lokonga 21, Ben White 23, Ramsdale is 23, Sander Burge is 23. You know, so, um, you know, they are, they, they're in line with the other stuff that we've done. You know, I mean, the thing about we need bodies, we've got loads of them though. When you think about what we've got in the squad, even in midfield we, with Thomas Partey when he's back, Granit Xhaka, Lokonga, Mohamed Elneny, Ainsley Maitland-Niles, Joe Willock, Lucas Torreira, whenever he comes back, 
uh, you know, that's seven central midfielders. I'm not saying uh, all of uh, guys, Andrew, but, Andrew, Andrew, I'm let's, let's be real. I'm saying that we have these players. Yeah, but Andrew, and let's get real. Them. Andrew, I'm, let's I'm be not real. Not bring in players. I'm not saying we don't need to bring in players. I'm saying that if we add to the squad in an area where there's already a load of uh, players in, in that position, like I want to, do you want a right back? I'd like a right back. Well, we got four of them at the moment, four, and we can't or won't sell any of them. If we bring in another one, what are we going to get for the ones that we have? Because they know we're so desperate to, 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 to move players on. So I don't think, I, I agree. I think our, our issue is quality. It's not necessarily numbers. Ev, what was it you wanted to say to Andrew? Torreira ain't coming back. Let's, let's just have it right. Willock's probably going to go. El Nenny, if, if we're going to be relying on El Nenny to come in and do a job, it's not happening. So, so that we, we need minimum two, two plus two competence of four central midfielders who you can rely on, who you could rotate. We don't have that at the moment. We just don't have it. And if we could get Torreira in and Torreira would do a job, great. But our problem is with Torreira, he hasn't settled and he lost his mum and he's homesick and all of this stuff. Because if Torreira was there and happy to be in there, I, hey, he would solve a big problem for us, I think. I he prefer doesn't want to be there. Yeah, I don't think he does. But I mean, I prefer Torreira to El Nani. Mm -hmm. Of course. 100%. Yeah. You know, I just think that the, the problems that we have of we're a bit overstocked, you know, we're, with players and we're not, uh, it doesn't look like we're, we're having much success when it comes to, to selling players or moving players on. So it's just that it's not that we don't need the quality. It's, it's how you, how you approach the end of a window with a bloated squad, because this was the problem last season. This was the big problem last season where we didn't have enough places for, for some of the players and we know the high profile issue that went on there and, and everything else, nor do we have European football to spread out football among a, a fairly big squad. So the squad kind of needs to be trimmer this season it needs to be a bit slimmer than it has been, you know? Um, so that's, that's the toughest thing as well, isn't it? Andrew is the, you know, it's, it's so hard when we can't shift anyone in mm. order to make some of these other things happen. And clearly we do need, to shift some of these players on, whether it's wages like William, um, you know, uh, because also, you know, like Kalasinac, I mean, he's on what one, is it one ten or one twenty? I, I, yeah. I can't, I can't around that. Yeah, around that yeah. And in this day and age where the world's changing and finances are tough and you kind of like have a short shelf life as a footballer, you know, people are used to living a certain way, no matter how much mm. you earn, you have um, your life set up a certain way and it's really tough for these players to say, okay, well, I'll go, knowing that they'll just get a smidgen of what they're earning now at, at the Arsenal. So that's that's the toughest part. You well, know? I mean, don't forget, Solf. Don't forget um, sorry, Andrew, just don't forget, we got him for nothing. Kalasinac came to us for nothing. There was no transfer fee because he came on a free, which is why he earned such good money. I know, so, but the fact is he is still earning good money and he's not playing very well and that's the problem, right? We've, yeah, we've but that's, this contract. That's, I understand. I understand. Yeah. Um, Andrew, what were you going to say about the, the, the was it the Kalasinac thing? Kalasinac, I mean, he's seen his mate Mesut Ozil get paid off, got all his money and was given a loan to Fenerbahce. He's seen Mustafi get mm -hmm. paid off. He's seen Socrates get paid off. So if you're him this summer... Why wouldn't you look for something similar? You know your surplus to requirements. Tierney is there. He's going to start every game. Tavares is the backup. We just signed him. I mean, he's literally redundant. The only possible place you could see him as is like a backup if we play a back three and he's backup for Pablo Marie or Gabriel. But, you know, there's no place for him. There's no place for him at Arsenal. So I, I think they'll do something similar with Kalasinac that they did with Ozil uh, uh and Mustafi, they'll they'll either pay him off, or he'll go on a loan um, to whatever club he goes to. And over the course of the season, we will pay a certain percentage of those wages. We'll just eat the wages. We're going to have to pay him anyway. Why didn't that happen? Someone just put it in chat. Um, I'll find it here. But uh, Ray, why didn't 
Kalasinac, um, why didn't they pay him off with the rest of them in January? I, I think it was the the length of the contract. Ozil, uh, Mustafi, and Socrates. Socrates all, yeah. and what, what up they, at the end of the season, yeah. weren't they? Yeah, they I think up so. at the end of the season, he had another year. He had another year, so I think it was just probably too too expensive for them to do that. But mm. if he goes on loan and some club pays forty percent of his wages or fifty percent of his wages, uh, and we we eat the rest, it's money we're going to have to spend anyway. So. We're saving. We're saving money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, where does it start? Andrew, what's your? I know last week I gave you some homework, but we moved um, the show week, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a couple of those those questions but um the biggest one i'd love to know from you is what is your biggest fear for next season the biggest fear is that we don't improve the creative side of our team for me i think it was strange to see arsenal have a you know one of the best defensive records in the premier league the fear is that we don't improve. We don't get goals out of Aubameyang. We don't get the goals we should get out of Pepe, out of uh, Bakayo Saka, out of um, Lacazette if he stays. I think our issues are, are yeah, they're creative. I, I think maybe Mikel Arteta is just a little bit too cautious in the way that he sets up his team, the way that the team plays. I'd like us to, I'd like to see us be a bit more exciting, a bit more fun to watch. Because we weren't really last season, you know, it was a bit of a, a bit of a chore to watch us at times. And I do think that there are exciting players. When you think about Tierney, Martinelli, Saka, Smith Rowe, Pepe, Aubameyang, uh, Thomas Partey when he's fit, you know, there's Ben White who's just been brought in. Uh, you know, there's there's the bones of something there for sure, but it's about whether or not they can or are allowed to express themselves on the pitch within the fairly rigid structures that Mikel Arteta puts in place with the way he operates, the way he wants his team to play and, and all that kind of stuff. So I'm hoping that he would, you know, just uh, to coin a phrase from the great man, let the handbrake off a little bit. <laughs> Very nice. I, I don't um, buy. In, I don't buy into all that handbrake nonsense. I think it's. I think it's. Well, he nonsense. said it himself, didn't he? The, yeah, but I think it's all nonsense. I, I think it's. Why all did nonsense. he say it then? Well, I don't know why he said it, but I think it's all nonsense because when you're a player, I've never listen. I've played in the game for twenty odd years. There's not one manager who didn't want me to go out there and not express myself. Not one. Well, Sam Allardyce does that to all of his players. <laughs> no, but no, no, he doesn't. This is the whole thing. But Sam Allardyce. Express yourself been, being boring. No, Sam Allardyce has been very successful at what he's done. Of late, no, he hasn't been as successful. But however a, a manager sets it up, that's his business. But I'm telling you, I've been involved in football now, professional football, for 35 years. And there has not been one manager who doesn't want me to express myself. The, our problem is we just weren't good enough last season. We showed flashes of it. We, but Kev, uh, how instance, can you say that when we played and he set the team up the way no, he did? No, hold in, on. Hold right, on. Okay. Can I finish? Yes, of course. You may so, finish. So my point is this. We saw flashes of the team playing well. For instance, we saw flashes against Wolverhampton Wanderers, where we were sensational. We should have blown them out the water. It should have been, it should have been over. Problem, we couldn't take our chances. After the first, what is it, half an hour against West Ham, for the next hour, we were incredible. So again, is it him playing with the handbrake on? Or is it the team not doing what they're supposed to do? I think it's the team not doing what they're supposed to do. And we should be better this season. Well, someone just said in chat, which I thought was a good point, there's a difference between how you set up your team and uh, where is it from Universal Greek? Expressing yourself and setting up not to lose are very different things, Casey. Well, no team wants to lose. So I don't understand what... 
what that well, actually means. No, because what it means is, is yeah, what does opinion, it mean? I'd love Andrew's take on it too. Um, and then you can answer is there were times, for example, against Man City where we set up not to lose that game. Right. Well, you, hold on, Sophie. Yeah. Against the big teams who can really hurt you, you set up to be competitive. You don't go gung-ho because you know if you go gung-ho... It's not even about gung-ho. It's just no, about... No, 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 hold on. It's, you, we're talking about how you set up, remember? Yeah. So, that's what you said. You set up not to lose. You set up to stay in the game. That's what you do. You set up to stay in the game, but you're not playing with a handbrake on. When you get the opportunity to hurt them, that's what you're supposed to do. We played oh. with the handbrake on against teams like Villa and Wolves. Andrew? I just sometimes feel that I do wonder if the players are maybe inhibited a little bit by the manager barking instructions um, throughout the game. And I think it's been a curiosity of this season without fans where, where a manager can make himself heard to a player over the other side of the pitch where he never would have been able to before. And I think there's something instructive at times to listen to a coach talk to his players, and it's quite interesting. I, I just, I just don't think over the course of a 38 game season, when you score whatever amount of goals you scored, was it 58 goals, something like that, mm -hmm. where you don't make enough chances? I think most people would say that our biggest issue last season was, A, not scoring enough goals and not making enough chances on a consistent basis. I think some of that has to be down to the way that the manager is setting up his team and instructing his team. I accept that we could use better players, but then that's true of every team in the world. They always feel like they could use better players. We had a 25-goal-a-season a striker who I know had some issues off the pitch and everything else as well, who ended up with... 12 or 15 goals last season you know our leading scorer was Lacazette with what 14, 14 something goals, like that yeah. it's not enough so I think um I'm not saying Arteta sets his team up to 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 just not lose or to not play but I think there is like there's a difference when someone like Emil Smith Rowe comes into the team and immediately again to to coin a phrase starts to put some oil in the engine. You know, that player makes a difference to the way that your team can play. Um, so, so hold on, Andrew. Mm. So if Emil Smith-Rowe comes in and, and put some oil in the engine, why, mm -hmm. does, why does he do that? Sh shouldn't he not be doing that because Arteta sets them up differently or sets no, them no. up to... So this is my point. My point is the players have to go out there and do it. Yeah, but they don't. That's what uh, I'm saying. That, that's my uh, whole uh, point. Uh, hold on, sometime. Like, okay, the Europa League semi finals, it wasn't the players' fault. So, whose Come fault on. was it then? He's playing right, Jacker on. at left back and he tried to get away with that Sophie. once too many times. Sophie, Kev. It's, two, it's two legs. Sophie. He got scored by Unai Emery. It's two legs, Sophie. And he screwed up both legs. Sophie, over two legs. And we lost that home to over Unai. Over two legs. It was embarrassing. Just over we, two legs, we Arsenal pathetic. just weren't good enough. We would have been it's, in the Champions League if he'd had just done his job. It's that simple, Sophie. Arsenal were just not good enough yet again. But okay, could some of the uh, could some of that be down to the fact that we started Emil Smith Rowe as a false nine, a position that he'd never really played before in a European semi final? I mean, no, man, no, 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 Andrew. Andrew. I tell why? you why. I tell you why. Because in the second leg we had chances. <laughs> but in the first leg is when no, he played. No. The, the uh, yeah, game. I know. But there's still a second game, and we had chances. But you at can't the throw away a ninety-minute game. We're well, not throw it away, but you can't. You can't mismanage a game uh, in a European semi-final. You have to maximize what you've got in your team in both legs, not just and, one. It's like how many times have we uh, played a bad half? And Andrew. we go, okay, well, we'll do it better in the set. We yeah, throw away a lot of football. Yeah, but the 90 minutes is a half. The first leg, 90 minutes is a half. Sure. I'm saying so don't. When, so don't when wait. we get them back to the Emirates, now we're on our patch. We fluffed our lines.
We fluffed our lines. You cannot tell me we didn't have opportunities. We weren't great, but we had opportunities to score and we couldn't take it. That's the difference. But the difference is Villarreal scored a couple of goals in the first half, first 20 minutes of the of the first leg. Yeah. You know? Yeah, but the first leg is the first leg. My point is... It counts. Score, of course it counts. If we score one goal at the Emirates, we're through. <laughs> but we're not good enough. This is my point. We are not good enough to, to do it. And it's not the manager saying, stopping the lads doing it. They just weren't good enough last but season. It, yeah, but I mean, if you're saying all we need to do is score one goal on one hand and then say no, on I the said other... All we, no, I said all we needed to do was score one yeah, goal yeah, and we're yeah. through. Yeah. But all we needed to do was maybe not concede those goals in, in the opening stage. I, I Look, at I... I, I the question was about what the fear was. And my fear for next season is that we don't quite uh, click from an uh, attacking perspective. I, I hope that we will. I think we've got the attacking talent to do it. And all I want to see from Mikel Arteta is just a little bit more emphasis on, you know, a, a part of the game that he was really good at at Everton as a player. You know, I know he dropped back when he was at Arsenal and played this sort of um, deep lying playmaker role for us. And he did it pretty well but when he was at Everton he was a number 10 basically you know that aspect of the game is something that should be well within his grasp and I think if you were to ask Mikel Arteta himself what would be the the one improvement you want to see from your team next season and he will say more goals more chances and if we do that we're going to finish higher up the table Here's a question then, Andrew, and nine, Sophie. Nine minutes. It, we got a hard it, stop. Yeah, Go here's on, a here's a question for you then. If Mikel Arteta says that, that's what he would want, does that mean the players have to improve? Um, I mean, isn't that his job to improve them? As I, the I'm just ask, no, I'm just asking a question. You're saying if that's what Arteta wants, and yeah. we all want that, yeah. doesn't that mean that the players who go out there have to improve? Yeah, maybe they maybe they have to execute the instructions or the game plan better than they have done last season. But my, uh, I don't know if you agree with this or not. But I mean, I, I think there was an emphasis, not a, a complete focus, but I think there was um, from the time he arrived from Mikel Arteta an emphasis on on creating something relatively solid defensively that he could then build on because we were a mess towards the end of the Unai Emery era. You know, you think about that Watford game with 30 shots in one game. Yeah. I think I think what he's tried to do is build some kind of foundation defensively upon which he can then place that attacking improvement. Mm -hmm. So that's all I'm saying is that that's what I'm looking for next season because, um, you know, we did have a good defensive record last year, but we have to now couple that with, the sort of attacking threat that that a team like Arsenal uh, deserves to bring to the game and, and bring to the fans every week. Wow, that's a great discussion. And um, Andrew, can you come back for a part two of this? Because I only got through half the stuff I wanted to. So, <laughs> sure, um, yeah. whenever you want me, no okay. problem. Because uh, it's just too good. Uh, I'll take, I'll take, Andrew, I'll tell you one thing I would do. <laughs> Give me 10 one nils. All day long. I would take one nil to the Arsenal all day long. Yeah. Because, I, because you know what that means? That means that we're learning. All this attack, attack, attack. No, let's win one nil. Let's learn how to win. Tight, tight games. I'm, I'll yeah, take I, that. I, I Look, I'll take it too. I, you know, maybe I'd be happier with two nil wins or three nil wins. Nothing <laughs> wrong with that either, is it? So, you know. It's. Uh, <laughs> I. I just. I, I think that there is the 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 sort of the foundation is there, and if we're going to do something next season, I think we've got to build on it a little bit. That's mm -hmm. all. I think we've. Uh, the, the frustration I think is that I think we're capable of it. That we've got good young players. We've got good attackers. We've got maybe our two strikers are heading towards the September of their careers, and that's something we've got to consider at some point in the not too distant future. But. There's a lot there to be excited about with Pepe, with Saka, with Smith Rowe, with Martinelli, with Aubameyang, with Partey. You know, there's 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 talent there. There's goals there in that team. Add a bit more creativity. Bring in another creative midfield player. 
bring in an Odegaard, bring in a Madison, whoever it might be, even if they're maybe a bit of a stretch, but bring in somebody else to take and share some of the burden with Smith Rowe. And I think this team can score more goals. And I think if we score more goals, we win more games, we finish higher up the table and we start making that trajectory go, you know, that way again. We, we, we need to, we need to fix our engine. Yeah, Com and completely. And that engine and all of the stuff that Andrew and you have been going back and forth at, uh, about, the one name that kept ringing in my ears is Abamyang, Abamyang, Abamyang. He's got to show up this season. He, mm. he, he, we need him more than ever this season. We need him to be the Abamyang that we all fell in love with at the Arsenal and respected when he was at Dortmund. So, um, for me, that's like the biggest thing as well because it, you can create as many chances as you want. But if Lacazette and Ober can't finish, and here's the, Andrew, the, the, with something Kevin and I have talked about a lot is we didn't get a lot of goals coming from other players because he was going through such a tough time, right? Yeah. Um, ESR needs to score more. Saka needs to score more. Pepe especially is the one that needs to score more. Martinelli needs to be given more chances, perhaps if Aubameyang's not off to a great start um, yeah. this season. Uh, and I think we all agree on that one, right? Yeah, I mean, he's a, he's a real talent. Um, quite where he's going to fit in the team, we'll have to wait and see. But look, I think everybody can pick up the slack. And one of the other issues, I suppose, is we don't get a, you know, we don't get too many goals from our central midfield players. The other clubs have these guys who can chip in with five, six, seven goals. And over the course of the season, that could mean five or six points in the Premier League. You know, those goals can make a big difference. So I'm hoping... I know he's going to miss the start of the season, but he was so good in preseason. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping that Thomas Partey can chip in with a few goals next season because I think that will be big for us. Yeah. Once he gets one. I said that he'll score within the he'll first score, three yeah. games, yeah. and that's out the window because he's not going to be playing in the first three games. Well, so. look, one thing we don't know, apparently it might not be as bad as first four. Well, that so, would be wonderful. So, you know, let's say our prayers that he's uh, not out for too long. Uh, well, look, you guys, don't forget to go to footballprizes.co.uk um, .co to get your ticket for the Yang boot. Um, that is up for grabs this week. I gave a free ticket away yesterday, and the winner of that is Abhay Singh. So well done to you. Um, your free ticket is, and the number is on its way via email. Here's the boot, the flying man. We'd like to see that next season. Come on, Oba, get Plenty of in. it. Plenty of it we need. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And Andrew, let everyone know where they can find you. I mean, if they've been living under a rock for the last 15 <laughs> years, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, just uh, arsblog.com. Everything we do is on there, the podcasts and the news and, and everything else, the apps and all the stuff. So that's where we are. Okay, wonderful. And Kev, you take us out. We'll be back tomorrow night with Kevin Says. Three top shelf questions from listen, the ledge. Listen, thanks for Andrew for coming on. I really appreciate it. Hey, listen, Andrew, you're more than welcome to come back. Good debate. Thanks, Sophie, for being the host with the most as always. And the stars of the show is the squaddies. Always great. Always great to read your comments, whether I like them or not, about Arteta's lawyer. Look after yourselves, everyone, and see you tomorrow for Kev Says. And squaddies, adieu.